Good evening, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome you for this uh, uh, second webinar of Indian Arthroscopy Society and Indian Women Arthroscopy uh, Series webinar. The first one was held uh, one month back before the knee arthroscopy. Now we'll be uh, doing a webinar on shoulder arthroscopy. So over to you, Dr. Sachin. Yeah, thank you so much, Sandeep. And um, thank you, firstly, to our um, guest, overseas guest, Dr. Bertie Bo, who's a fantastic and prolific figure in this, in this field of sports medicine and, uh, you know, surgery for the knee and the shoulder. Thanks a lot to our good friend, Niha, who has been very instrumental in putting together a very fantastic, uh, enthusiastic group who want to really excel in this field of arthroscopy. Thank you also to a good friend, Nafisa, who is a MSK radiologist. And um, Nafisa has taken time out and uh, gladly agreed to be on this uh, lovely webinar. And we have all these uh, lovely, brilliant other uh, faculty from India who are happy to support us. So I think it's really high time that you know I stop talking and we uh, hand it over to the first speaker. So Neha, quick introduction, and then let's get on to the program, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sajin, sir. So good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome our international and national faculties today, and our, also our viewers. So Eva, uh, Indian women uh, in arthroscopy, it's a wing, women's wing of uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society, has been formed by our president, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, sir, and very well supported by our secretary, Dr. Sandeep Biraris. And I'm excited to share that since its inception, the members are increasing in numbers and this group is taking great steps forward. This is our second webinar of IAS and EVA, which will cover basics of shoulder arthroscopy. And uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Bertie Bo as our international faculty today. She's the head of arthroscopy unit at Oslo University Hospital, Norway, with special interest in complex knee and shoulder surgery. She has done her PhD in orthopedics in 2012. Currently, she is the president of Norwegian Society for Surgery of Shoulder and Elbow, Vice General Secretary of ESCA. She is editorial member of various uh, renowned journals like AJSM and CASTA. She is a committee member of ISACOS and also serves as Norway's National Delegate for European Shoulder and Elbow Society. She has a vast experience not only in shoulder arthroscopy, but shoulder, but also in shoulder arthroplasty. So today it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bertie Bo from Oslo University Hospital, Norway. Welcome, Dr. Bo. And our viewers are keen on listening to you today. Our another speaker is, our another speaker is Dr. Sundar Rajan former secretary of IS, a senior knee and shoulder arthroscopy surgeon and head of arthroscopy. Uh, uh, unit at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. He is the past president of Indian Association of Sports Medicine and Indian Foot and Ankle Society, president of uh, Tamil Nadu Arth Arthroscopy Society, and committee member of ISACOS Leg, Foot and Ankle. He is one of the leading orthopedic uh, and arthroscopic surgeons of India. Welcome, Dr. Sundar Rajan, sir. Thank you, Nehru. Our radiologist, Kali. Uh, is Dr. Nafisa Bhatta from New, New Delhi. Currently, she is a consultant radiologist at Mahajan Imaging and Sports Injury Center at Savdarjan Hospital, New Delhi. She has done her fellowships in MSK USG at Jefferson University, Pennsylvania, and also MSK Trauma Fellowship from Melbourne, Australia. She specialized in sports injuries and rehab imaging and musculoskeletal interventions. She is sub-editor to many renowned journals including Indian Journal of Musculoskeletal Radiology. Welcome, Dr. Nafisa. Our other speaker is my friend, Dr. S. Samudeshwari. She is working as assistant professor in orthopedics at Sri Lakshmi Narayana Institute of Medical Sciences, Pondicherry. She is a recipient of uh, prestigious Marcella Uribe Award at CICOT. And she is executive member of Women's Wing of Indian Orthopedic Association and also the Shoulder and Elbow Committee of CICOT. 
She is a founding member of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association Women's Wing and reviewers to many journals. Welcome, Samu. Our uh, next speaker is my colleague, Dr. Ravisha Bhadwaj, Assistant Professor at Department of Orthopedics, GMC Patiala, Punjab. Now she is currently working on deputation in Delhi at Sports Injury Center, Sabdarjang Hospital. She's a member of ISACOS IODA CICOT. She also has won Marcella Uraiba Award at CICOT. She has been a sports person herself during her school days, and she has won gold medals in game of fencing at junior and senior national level champions. So without much ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Ravisha, to present her talk on examination of shoulder joint to pick up the right pathology. So Ravisha, can you share your screen, please? Thank you, Neha, for uh, such a wonderful introduction. And uh, so is it visible? It's coming, yeah. OK. So shoulder examination, picking the right pathology. So when a patient presents with shoulder pain, we assess the patient with a detailed history and thorough examination. A well-defined algorithm can lead to a very accurate estimate of the pathology. So we go stepwise. First step is to clarify whether the cause is trauma. And if there is no bony injury, one should suspect soft tissue injury. And then we proceed to the third step to rule out the soft tissue specific pathology. Second, we exclude the referred brain from the other areas like cervical spine or other radiculopathies from other organs and uh, etc. Now, the third step is to um, exclude or to identify the extra glenohumeral pain in which we identify uh, or we rule out the AC joint pathologies, the long head of biceps pathology and the scapular pathology. Especially we observe and examine the scapula. And the fourth is the glenohumeral pathology. Now, this is the uh, history taking, which we normally do, but we need to address these questions in the history. So is, the pain, is, is it because of pain or loss of power or instability or loss of range of motion? And then we look for the age of the patient. Is it a young athlete or a middle-aged or an old patient? And then the activity level, because different problems affect middle-aged national player than a middle-aged office worker. So a young thrower with the pain have a range of uh, having a range of problems due to the internal impingement. And then we come to the chronicity. Is it acute or is it chronic pain? So younger, younger patients, um, we keep in mind these uh, diagnoses. And in 40 above, we keep in mind the rotator cuff uh, pathology or impingement or arthritis and capsulitis. Now, in inspection, we can't miss the popoy sign or the <laughs> bicipital tendon rupture. And the most important, which I would like to focus is on the scapula, the back of the patient. So in high, uh, in spingle deformity, there will be, the position will be high. And don't miss this uh, shoulder dyskinesia, because after this, you can rule out other pathologies. Uh, first, we check for active movements, and then we go for passive. And um, we, we we need to note if there is any restriction movement due to pain or the mechanical locking. So Apley's scratch test is uh, a very good test in which four of the movements uh, are recorded. This is adduction and internal rotation. And then uh, this uh, will indicate that abduction and external rotation. Now, a patient when comes with instability, we perform the tests for anterior instability, anterior uh, apprehension test. Patient sitting in supine position, arm um, at 90 degree abduction with increased external rotation. Now, examiner exerts an anterior translatory force with this thumb, uh, with the palm posteriorly on the humerus. So if there is pain, then it suggests anterior instability. So Job's apprehension and relocation test, um, the arm is abducted in 90 degrees and externally rotated. So when the pain, which produces pain from impingement, an application of 
a posteriorly directed force to the humeral head, uh, which relocates it in, in the glenoid, relieves the pain in the patient with instability. Right? So this is a relocation test. Now, posterior instability uh, in this, with the patient lying supine with 90 degree forward flexion of the shoulder and elbow 90 degree, uh, posterior force is directed and there will be pain posteriorly for uh, posterior instability. Now, this is a Kim test for um, posterior labral tear. The patient uh, in a sitting position with a 90 degree of abduction of the shoulder, the examiner holds the arm elbow and applies an axial force and 45 degree upward diagonal elevation while also pushing the inferiorly and posteriorly on the upper arm. So is, uh, there will be pain and posterior, uh, posteriorly in case of the posterior labral tear. In this uh, circumduction test, the examiner um, holds the arm in ext extension and abduction and in this, the humeral head is felt and it sublux posteriorly in case of recurrent shoulder dislocation. So this is a sulcus sign which we see in inferior laxity, which is uh, not to be missed. And in biceps pathology, uh, speed test and Jurgensen tests are commonly done. So in both these tests, the pain is located the, to the biceps groove. So uh, in uh, speed test, the patient's elbow is extended, forearms opinated, and humerus elevated. So the examiner resists the forward flexion of the humerus. And in Jurgensen test, the patient um, patient's elbow is flexed and forearm is pronated, and the examiner holds their arm at the wrist, and patient actively supinates against the resistance. So biceps instability, which is very commonly associated with rotator cuff tear. So with abduction and internal rotation, the patient, uh, there will be palpebral or audible snap anteriorly of the tendon. And now in slap lesions, Oberyn test is commonly which we perform in OPD. So patient with the arm at 90 degree with elbow extended, fully extended and adducted 10 to 15 degree medially with internal rotation. The patient, uh, the examiner resists the hand and same is done with the external rotation in this. So if there is pain in the top of the shoulder, this is the AC joint pathology and in case of uh, slap tear, it is, the pain is inside the shoulder. Now impingement tests, most importantly, arc, uh, painful arc syndrome in this uh, painful arc sign where the patient has pain in 60 to 120 degree of abduction. And in Nier's impingement, uh, the examiner performs this with a maximal uh, passive forward flexion with an internal rotation. And the patient will have pain. In Hawkins Kennedy, the uh, it is performed by forward flexing the humerus to 90 degrees with a forcefully internal rota uh, internally rotating the shoulder. So in both these, there will be pain due to impingement. And in case of Nier's uh, test, we uh, inject local anesthesia in the subacromial space so the pain goes away. That's the diagnostic of rotator cuff impingement or a tear. So in rotator cuff, these are the most commonly done tests. In this, the patient attempts to elevate the arm against the resistance with arm in 90 degree abduction in a 30 degree in a full internal rotation. So, so there will be pain in this if there is a pathology in supraspinatus. It's a full can test. Now, external rotation resistance test. In this, the patient is not able to resist the examiner's hand and hold it in external rotation. And external rotation lag sign. So this is when uh, infraspinatus and TDs. And in this, the patient is not able to hold the externally rotated, in externally rotated position when the examiner let goes of the forearm and the arm, it lags back. So this is abnormal and that's uh, normal, you can say. So in subsapularis, we do all these three tests, uh, verbal lift off test in which uh, the patient is not able to lift off the hand of the back. In bear hug test, we check for internal rotation. So patient is not able to resist the external rotation done by the uh, examiner. And uh, this belly press test or the Napoleon sign. So in this, the patient is not able to uh, maintain 
the arm in internal rotation. So elbows go back. This is the horn blower sign or patties test, which is for mainly for TDs minor, but this is seen as uh, in massive uh, rotator cuff tear. And here the patient cannot laterally rotate the shoulder when, he, when the patient is asked to. So drop arm sign is also really important where uh, large uh, rotator cuff tears or maybe in, um, you can say axillary nerve palsy also, we can see this. So patient cannot uh, lower the arm slowly when he's asked to and instead drops the arm immediately due to pain or uh, pathology. Now in AC uh, joint pathology, uh, we have this passive cross chest test where uh, while performing this, there will be pain over the AC joint in this or they will be crepitus in case of injury or degeneration. And this is Paxinon's test where the examiner pushes the acromion uh, into, the uh, into the clavicle and, oh, sorry. So there will be pain. Now, most importantly, scapular test, which we should not uh, miss out. So in assistant test and retraction test, um, so examiner assists in the uh, assists and uh, pushes the scapula while abducting. So they will the pain or weakness will be relieved while doing this. And in, in re, uh, retraction test, um, what happens is the patient while uh, pull, uh, while abducting the arm, the examiner retracts the scapula and the pain relieves in this case. So these both tests are initial uh, done uh, beforehand so that so as to um, rule out any scapular pathology so this is the driscoll sign and uh, we have time i can discuss this so in this position the pa uh, the patient will have pain deep pain in the posterior glenohumeral joint while performing this 90 degree to 120 degree abduction in the lying down position. So this is a dynamic shear test done. And uh, these are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Ravisha. That was right on time. <laughs> that was so fast. So uh, if anyone has questions. So I had one question for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, in our, I mean, some uh, doctors have really very busy OPD. So which are the tests you would advocate for them to do? These are the only most sensitive and most specific tests you would advocate. Uh, specifically for uh, rotator cuff or apprehension? A young person and in cases of an older patient. Yeah, so... Uh, I just told you the most important exam, uh, examin uh, examinations. So like in rotator cuff, we can't miss any of these and it takes just two few minutes. Like, and in impingement test, Nears and Hawkins, these are uh, not to be missed in painful arc syndrome, uh, painful arc sign. In instability, uh, definitely in young patient with uh, uh, recurrent uh, instability, we will be able uh, to see the sulcus sign, which is very common if uh, that patient has recurrent instability, uh, recurrent shoulder dislocation. And in elderly or above 40, 40 year old patient, uh, we mostly uh, rule out rotator cuff tear and degenerative uh, pathologies. So, so these are the few tests and uh, in rotator cuff pathology, we cannot miss all these signs. Drop arm sign, I have seen very commonly uh, in my this uh, sports OPD. And so these are not the not to be missed. In impingement, only three tests I have told, which are very uh, commonly also seen. Needs impingement is with this uh, lignocaine uh, uh, injected, uh, we can rule out the cuff impingement in this okay. yeah thank you thank you very much for the so elaborate talk so uh, with this uh, you're on mute yeah yeah
So there are no questions in the chat box. So uh, I would like to proceed further and uh, we would like to uh, have our next speaker. So I would like to invite our next speaker who will be uh, Dr. Nafisa Bhatta, who will be talking on radiology lightening up the way in the dark spaces. Dr. Nafisa, please share your screen. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar. I am going to be talking about radiology of the shoulder joint in 10 minutes. It is a tough task for a radiologist to do that. So let's concentrate on the big players. And that is the rotator cuff problems of the shoulder as well as instability related problems. Rotator cuff is one unit and not four separate tendons. Uh, injuries occur because of chronic overuse, chronic impingement syndromes, chronic degenerative tears in already pathological tendons, and of course, acute trauma, post-surgical failures can be causes of rotator tears. When we talk about rotator uh, tears in the radiology language, very simply put is, if the tear extends from top to bottom of this, for example, there's a supraspinatus tendon, it is a full thickness tear. If it occurs it can occur at the critical zone. It can occur at the footprint. When we talk about partial thickness tear, there is a little bit of confusion. This is periarticular tear. This is a periarticular tear. And we usually describe them as either high grade or low grade, which means that it is transecting 50% of the tendon fibers or less than that. I implore you to get more ultrasounds done for the rotator cuff because it's a brilliant modality. You can see the fibrocartilage, you can see the hyaline cartilage, you can see the tendon attaching so well. You can even see the fat stripe in the bursa. So partial thickness tears can also be divided as one, two, and three, depending on less than three, three to six, or more than six mm. Whenever you have a partial thickness tear of the anterior uh, supraspinatus or the superior subscapularis, it can also be uh, with a concomitant fully lesion. When it comes to full thickness tears, however, there's far more information required. One wants to know the size of the tear, which is mediolateral as well as anterior posterior dimension of the tear on the MR. One also needs to know the amount of retraction of the tendon and uh, the uh, muscle belly of the cuff, which means that you want to know how much is the volume reduction. So the an occupation ratio can be used for the supra as well as infraspinatus or we can go by the amount of fatty streaks within the muscle belly. So the Gutalia classification is used and sometimes both are present. So here's a patient, you can clearly see that this is a peribursal tear, it's partial, it's not going through and through, it's at the footprint and it's a high grade partial bursal sided tear. This is consequent to this uh, large nasty looking spur at the AC joint and there's some amount of bursal effusion and posterior as well as lateral puddling. The question arises when there's a bit of confusion between high-grade partial and complete. So here's a high-grade partial thickness tear, and you can see that even though there are a few articular fibers that are preserved, they are nice and taut. When you look at this tear, it's not retracted, but the fact that there's undulation says that this is a complete or a full thickness tear. Tendinosis is one condition that is talked about less than it should be. Uh, it is basically a painful condition for patients. There's hypertrophy of the tendon, there's high signal within it, and there's haphazard collagen formation. It's a degenerative condition predisposing the tendon to tears. This condition of bicipital tendinosis is very, very common. This area, the genuine, the extraarticular LHBT is usually missed on MR because of its curvature and it's fraught with artifacts. This can be beautifully seen on ultrasound. You can see this biceps tendon here showing a nice fibrillar ecogenic pattern. And you can see the abnormal tendon, which is more than double its size with heterogeneity and small interstitial micro tears through it. And this is consequent to a lesser tuberosity spur. This is a patient um, who had a massive rotator cuff tear. So you can see that large heel subacromial spur, and you can see that this subscap, uh, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus are both torn and retracted. Here you can see the reduction in the volume of the muscle belly, as well as fatty streaks through it. Calcific tendonitis, another condition that is uh, very painful, calcium hydroxyapatite crystal deposition, which is toothpaste-like material within the tendon, inciting inflammation and pain, depends on what phase the patient is in. Patient can have considerable amount of pains and at times the x-ray is negative. In this case, you can see the deposit. 
these deposits deposits can be intratendinous they can be uh, they can leak into the bursa they can even have intraosseous extension here's a patient with confluent uh, deposits in the infraspinatus and this would be a good candidate for a barbitage so this is another patient supraspinatus he had multiple calcific deposits within the tendon and again ultrasound beautifully demonstrates these you can also go about injecting or doing a barbitage and ultrasound is a great modality for diagnosis as well as follow up here's a patient post op case mri this was a double uh, row rotator repair you can see that one uh, set of anchors is in place but as we move um, a little further you will see that the cuff has retracted and this is because some of the anchors have flown off and this is a case of rotator cuff repair failure Another condition very common, adhesive capsulitis, patient comes with pain, uh, restricted range of motion. It's because of inflammation of the capsule as well as the ligaments around the shoulder. On MRI, classically, you'll see inflammation at the anterior band of the IGHL. And another place is the anterior rotator cuff interval. But if the findings are more confluent, you can even see the entire anterior and posterior capsule that is uh, showing a high signal like a solar eclipse or it's called the corona sign. talking about bursitis a condition where you can easily use ultrasound as a useful tool and uh, here in a patient of chronic bursitis there were some adhesions and every time he would abduct the arm there'd be this pop and the bursa would slide out this is a swimmer's shoulder painful arc syndrome going on to instability shoulder is a joint that is fraught with problems of stability versus mobility Uh, and clearly we know that the glenoid cup is insufficient to restrict the round large humeral head static and dynamic stabilizers um, of the shoulder let's see what the findings are on mr you can see a classic bankart lesion where there is a complete full thickness uh, labial tear and there's a periosteal tear as well and there's edema in this region you can have a osseous bankart lesion which is just a chip fracture of the anterior inferior glenoid a perthes lesion where the periosteum is intact but there is complete labrosseous and labrochondral separation and there's a pouch formation uh, these lesions are sometimes occult and best seen if you do an uh, aber view which is um, abduction and extern rotation alpsa is when the labrum gets macerated and medialized and a hagel lesion which is important is the humeral avulsion of the ighl here's a hagel that is actually displaced and it's between the axillary artery and nerve similar is true about posterior um, instability so you can have posterior labral tears like these or you can have a reverse uh, bankart osseous tears like these or a pulsa lesion which is the analog of the alpsa lesion where there is maceration of the posterior labrum or a kims lesion again a pouch formation and uh, this is an analog of the reverse perthes lesion when we talk about instability and severity index initially the only bone uh, lesions were compared on the x-ray so you'd look at the hillsack lesion in a regular view in an ap view in an external rotation and if the hillsack index and if the hillsack lesion was well seen on external rotation you would say that there is a um, significant bone loss a similar thing went about for the glenoid where we look at this anterior sclerotic line and its continuity so and if it's missing like in this case where it stops short we'll say that there is significant glenoid bone loss here you can also see a hillsack and this was 16% you can always see an osseous bankart like this where there's a loose body in the joint so how much is too much initially it was proposed to be 25 and then the benchmark has gone down to 15 and some authors even uh, say that 12% is too much soft tissue versus bony stabilization the answers are if we have evidence of the bipolar bone loss so considering that the posterior superior um, humeral head comes into contact with 83% of the glenoid diameter in a position of athletic abduction so that which is called the glenoid tract we understand that if the hill sac lesion is smaller than the glenoid tract it would be accommodated and it would be an on track lesion or a non engaging lesion and if the hill sac lesion is larger than the glenoid tract it would be off track lesion or an engaging lesion now methods of measurement are so many we at sports injury center follow a simple methodology before surgery we take in we always get a ct done we always take into consideration bilateral shoulders if the patient has not had 
uh, dislocation on one side is very easy. You just measure the glenoid diameters and you find out what the bone loss is. So in this case, it was 17%. You also can easily calculate the glenoid tract. Hillsack index is basically the Hillsack defect plus a one mm of the hills of the crest of the rotator cuff. So here in this case, the hill sac was larger than the glenoid tract, and hence it's an off track or an engaging lesion. CT also affords you the advantage of taking accurate measurements of the coracoid, which can be bent over and difficult on axial images. So here's the coracoid process. Now, what should one do, CT or MR or both? Well, we follow um, the protocol where we put all patients into MR and before surgery, we get CTs done. There are papers that say that a three Tesla MRI with volumetric uh, capabilities is as good as a CT. But the thing is, CT is far e more easily available than a three Tesla MR. So here's a picture from the MR. Here's an osseous Bankart lesion. This is the glenoid diameter 18.8. Now, depending on how I fit my best fit circle, I'm finding that my bone loss can be from 27 to 21%. When I did a CT for the patient, it was 23%. Again, Hillsack index accurately measured, and one can also measure the coracoid process. Here's a 25-year-old footballer. He has a posterior dislocation, edema at the posterior glenoid, edema at the anterosuperior humeral head, which is the reverse Hillsack lesion. There's just a small shallow defect here. And we also see a posterior labral tear. There was also some remodeling at the posterior cortex of the glenoid telling us that this is a chronic injury. Again, CT helps us immensely. We just take the diameters on both sides and the glenoid difference in this case was 2.3 mm. Now we calculate something called a gamma angle, which is the medial side of the hill sac, reverse hill sac defect and the deepest point on the bicipital groove. And this is not at both, it's, both of them cannot be on the same level. And at times you have to interpose the image. So it may not be very accurate the way I'm showing you. And what we do is that we calculate the gamma, the corrected gamma angle, which is the gamma angle plus for every one mm of glenoid uh, defect, we add two degrees. So if a gamma angle is above 90 degrees, then that's an engaging reverse hill sac lesion. So one can also easily calculate the degree of retroversion in this patient. And sometimes calculating the retroversion on the other side also helps. Here's a patient post bank art repair. We did the MR. We know that there is a capsular end. There was a Hagel lesion. There are new findings. This was a new dislocation. And uh, the MR is again fraught with artifacts. It's really difficult to calculate the bone loss in such a patient. CT, however, looks very easy. One can easily calculate uh, the bone loss, as well as see the status of the bone uh, and the sutures. Here's the patient, his glenoid dimension. To the other side, it was calculated. The bone loss was 12.5%. And the hill sac also here, easily calculated with measurements of the coracoid in case the surgeon is planning to revise into a lethargy. So how we do it is that if the glenoid bone loss on MR is clearly more than 25%, I don't think that one needs to go in for a CT. But if the glenoid, and if the glenoid bone loss is less than 10%, again, we may not need a CT. But most cases, you land up doing a CT pre-surgery for these patients. And that's how we do it at our center. So thank you very much. It's, uh, I spoke too quickly, but I would like to touch upon all these topics and if there are any questions i'd like to feel some thank you thank you dr nafisa that was really very fluent talk and uh, there are questions for you uh, by dr samudeshwari uh, she wants to ask you uh, do you suggest any mri based parameters to assess glenoid bone loss that is one and how to differentiate between supraspinatus and infraspinatus on mri Glenoid bone, uh, you mean parameters as in we, uh, we are the best. So on MRI, you're looking at the ipsilateral shoulder. You don't have the other to compare. You'd lay down a circle which best fits the posterior and the inferior margin of the glenoid curvature. And you would find the extrapolated expected glenoid diameter right for the patient and so you already have the native glenoid you've measured the diameter you have the expected diameter and that's how you can calculate bone loss and how to differentiate between supra and infra on mri 
Okay, so uh, that's an anatomy talk. I can show you some images. Supraspinatus on the MR would clearly be above the level of the spine. So it's best to go about looking at it on the coronal and the sagittal. And um, usually the supraspinatus will attach on the uh, superior aspect of the greater tuberosity of the humerus and the infraspinatus will be posterior superior, even though they can have an admixing of tendon fibers, which is called the conjoint tendon. A lot of orthopedic surgeons don't believe in anything called the conjoint tendon, but there can be certain um, fibers that can decussate. And at that point, it can be difficult to identify them. I could show you an MR if you'd like. Oh, yeah. Uh... Oh, there is another question from our viewer, Dr. Pratima. She wants to ask yes. to all faculties that how often would you operate on rotator tears in young or active individuals despite MRI report of Gottlieb 3 or 4? So shall we start from Dr. Bertibo? Do you operate on Thank young you. individuals? Well, uh, there are several factors that I, that I assess when I um, consider to repair or not. And of course, Cotalier 3 or 4 is one of the factors that make me be a skeptical. <laughs> so then it depends if there's a trauma. It depends on the age of the patient. It depends if he's smoking of, or if he has diabetes. But if it's a healthy young person, uh, and there is a trauma in the history. In most cases, I will try to repair. Okay. So, Sundar, sir, what is your view on that? <laughs> yeah, this question requires 30 minutes talk. <laughs> <laughs> you would like I, to hear in three minutes. No, so what I'm saying that, I mean, it's because, first of all, the young patients, very young patients, you don't get a cuff tear. You know what I mean? Like if you think, if you talk about young patients, like you're talking about 45 years old or a 50 years old, 90% of the time, it will be a traumatic tear. You don't get a very rarely, you get a degenerative tear. The same patient comes very late. Suppose it's a neglected tear. Um, then you can talk about the gutlier type three or four. Then that could be the patient that comes very late, uh, like a, a year or a year and a half like that. But then that retraction slowly progress, I mean, going medially. Then these patients, uh, you're, uh, of course, these patients, what you are talking, I believe that she's asking question uh, like that is they're all retracted tears, hopefully. So anything which is retracted tear in a younger patient, we should try to salvage the joint. You, know, you, don't, go, you don't go for a, any replacements or something like that. Yeah. So we always try to uh, uh, do, conserve the joint as much as possible to the biological yeah. procedure. There are so many, uh, I mean, you know, there's a big topic. So uh, anything which is a uh, retracted tear, it's a chronic with the Gottlieb type 3 and 4. But literature supports, supports even up to great Gottlieb type 3 and 4. I mean, even up to 3, uh, good results if you do a repair. So we don't need to worry about the Gottlieb type 3 in a younger patients. The same questions if you ask in the older patient, then you, have, you can talk about other options. Younger patients always try to repair. Okay, so... Probably the definition of young is changing nowadays. 50, 55 is counted in young. So, uh, so what, what about you, Samudeshwari? Uh, I second the uh, opinion of uh, Dr. Sundar, sir. Uh, considering the age of the patient, I would definitely like to preserve the biology and anatomy as much as possible. So I would like to attempt and repair the cuff. And then I will uh, advise the patient that he he or she may need a prolonged rehabilitation. And if he or she is a sports person, then return to sports uh, be a difficult question for him. Yeah. And Dr. Ravisha? Yeah, same, sir. Same as uh, sir said, because uh, preservation is very important. These young patients, they need to go back and play. <laughs> I just have one question for Dr. Bertie before you, we uh, move on to the next talk. So uh, what is your preferred uh, choice, uh, USG ultrasound or uh, MRI? Because many a times MRI have got long uh, appointments. So what do you prefer in cases of acute scenario and in chronic scenarios? Yes, um, of course, I, I want the examination done <laughs> pretty fast, <laughs> so I know the results. So, 
So actually in Norway, I have to admit that we have pretty good access to MRI. So when they come to our hospital in the emergency unit, we get an MRI most of the time within two weeks. And that's that's good for cuff uh, tears. But we also have um, a few ultrasounds um, uh, machines in, in the hospital. So uh, if there are people available who can do ultrasound, we use that. So we can kind of, we see that here's a tear and then we can kind of prepare that this patient will need surgery probably. And then sometimes we do an MRI in addition if we are in doubt about the gutelier status, for example, or if there are, uh, if we suspect any other injuries as well, for example. But ultrasound is actually pretty good uh, if you just want to see if there's a rotator cuff tear or not. And also, of course, if the biceps is dislocated, very easy to see in ultrasound. It, it takes only two hours to do an MRI scan. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have much of a waiting period for MRI, so we can get it done in maybe one or two hours. Yes. So with this, thank you, Dr. Nafisa, for uh, brainstorming talk. So uh, with this, we'll move on to our uh, next talk, uh, which will be uh, delivered by Dr. Samudeshwari uh, on starting up the shoulder arthroscopy. So Dr. Samudeshwari. You're on mute, Sam. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I thank Indian Arthroscopy Society and Women's Wing of Indian Arthroscopy Society for providing me an opportunity to talk on starting up of shoulder arthroscopy. I'm Dr. Samundu Shri Sasinder. I work as Assistant Professor of Orthopedics at Sri Lakshmi Anna Institute of Medical Sciences. I do not have any conflict of interest. I would like to talk this uh, topic in five steps. Uh, from understanding the anatomy, the pathoanatomy, and the arthroscopic anatomy, to get oriented to the problem which the patient is presenting to you, to have a correct diagnosis, an accurate plan for that particular patient, and know the OR, your operating room, the positions and portals, and get familiarized with the basic instruments. And you have to understand that you to be from a novice surgeon to a master surgeon, you have a learning curve. What one has to understand is the normal surgical anatomy, which we do for regular operating of fractures and other soft tissue injuries and shoulders is different from arthroscopic anatomy. The arthroscopic anatomy is uh, to be understood in two common positions which we use. One is the lateral position, another is the beachhead position. In the lateral position, the, the glenoid is placed uh, more horizontal to the floor and the ball is on the top. And uh, as you do the diagnostic, you get to see the anterior aspect uh, while you just uh, get to see the rotator interval. It's bounded by the biceps superiorly. And uh, yeah. here, uh, as you go up, you get to see the rotator cuff, the attachments and uh, come and coming back posteriorly, we get to see the bad area and then slide and get into the joint again. Next is anatomy orientation in beach up position. Here, the glenoid is uh, facing a uh, parallel to the floor and uh, you can get to see a uh, better orientation of the rotator cuff uh, by abducting the shoulder and the attachment and insertion and the insertion of the biceps. And you also need to understand each shoulder is different and each patient is different. This is the third case where you get to see an extensive damage, cartilage damage of the shoulder. And the next step, once you understand the anatomy, you need to under, you need to make a correct diagnosis and have an accurate plan for your patient. There may be three categories. One is instability, one weakness, and arthritis. And the presentation may be acute or chronic. 
and if there may be involvement of either of these particular joints or a combination of these, the glenohumeral, acromiohumeral, or acromial clavicular or scapulothoracic. And once you have a clear diagnosis, uh, you correlate with radiological diagnosis and have a working plan for the patient. And you really need to think whether surgery is indicated for the patient or whether it is absolute or optional. Ensure the patient has undergone essential prehab rehabilitations and then uh, if it is a fail, then we think about uh, surgical options and ensure you are having all the implants and instruments and also a backup set of implants and instruments in case if you are going to have an intraoperative struggle. And you need to think, really think whether you are an expert to do that particular surgery, a complex or a simple procedure. And if you don't have an adequate expertise, ensure you have a uh, you have a, a expert surgeon who is available who can help you either intraoperatively or planning pre-op and rehab. Understanding this, let us understand the positioning of the patient in the OR. Uh, this is an example of patient in the OR in wheelchair position where the patient is uh, uh, where the patient is on the affected side. The surgeon stands on the affected side and the arthroscopy tower, the instrument tower, and the fluid and management suction systems are placed on the opposite side. The circulating nurse and the instruments are available to the surgeon on the same side. Out of the two common positions, first I would like to describe the BHR position. In the BHR position, we have three uh, separate positions. One is the BHR with the arm free and BHR position with spider assisted and BHR position with forward traction. When we don't have access to spider, we use BHR position with forward traction. And I commonly use BHR position for working for, for working for uh, subacromial space or uh, impingements and rotator cuff pathologies. Bichar position is not much comfortable for working anteriorly because the when we give traction, the anterior space becomes more crowded. So this is the position of the surgeon, the tower tubings. The next common position we use is lateral position. We use most commonly lateral position for operating on patients with instability for all bank art rippers and then slap rippers. And lateral position, this is an example of lateral position with spider positioning device. And then we commonly use lateral position for arm, arm hanging from the roof and we are quite comfortable as we don't have access to the spider. Sometimes lateral position are done with arm free where you have to work on tendon transfer procedures for extensive rotator cuff uh, tears. Having oriented to the position of the portals, uh, position of the patient, let us understand about the portals which we commonly use to do shoulder arthroscopy. The arthroscopy, uh, the most common portal which we commonly use is the posterior portal or the workhouse portal, which is uh, just below, uh, below the posterior margin of the acromion, two centimeter below and the one centimeter medial. And the next common portal which we use for diagnostic arthroscopy is the anterior uh, midclinoid portal. And uh, it is uh, directly uh, done under visualization from the posterior portal. The two and three portals are the lateral portals, which are used for working in the subacromial space. And the other accessory portals include the antero superior and antero inferior, and then the postro and uh, the postro inferior portals. The Neviasia portal is another common portal, uh, which is being uh, used for uh, rotator cuff repairs and slap repairs. Get familiarized yourselves with the instruments. The common instruments which we use include a stab knife and a switching stick for uh, getting access to the portals. And then the dilators and the cannulas, which we are using uh, for getting access and passage of various instruments, the shaver uh, for debridement of tissues. And these, these set of instruments, uh, which include the liberator and the RAS, which are used for the uh, repairing the lateral tissue and the bird, the set of bird beak, which is being used for remplissage. And then we have the lasso and the suture passes uh, for passing the sutures and then the knot pusher and the suture cutter for uh, repairing the, uh, for repairing the rotator cuff as well. So this is an example of arthroscopy in VHR position where we have uh, access where the surgeon is getting access to the posterior portal uh, with a stab incision and a hemostat uh, get access uh, near the shoulder joint and then with the gently with the drop sheet you penetrate and you feel the uh, surface the both the glenoid as well as the humeral head and uh, with the uh, assistant giving a mild uh, lateral traction, you get into the joint and direct your uh, trocar sheath towards the coracoid. 
So once you are into the joint, start doing the diagnostic round and uh, you get to identify the rotator and triple. And then with the help of a switching stick or a needle, 18 gauze needle, you enter the mid anterior glenoid portal. And then you can start using a probe and then start uh, visualizing the structures, palpate the biceps tendon, look for any uh, lax in the biceps tendon, palpate the glenoid and then the, the structures, the rotator cuff structures. The next is the subacromial arthroscopy. Here uh, you need to slide uh, just below the posterior uh, process of the acromion and then get into the subacromial space. Using the shaver system, you can you start debriding the basal tissues. And there is also the role of using pottery or electro frequency for achieving hemostasis. Arthroscopy in lateral position. As we have already discussed, we get to access from the posteriorly, and then we get to see the both posterior and anterior labrum. Here, the head is a little uh, subluxed anteriorly in this case. And then through the retrotar interval, you enter the you enter with an 18 gauge needle and then as a beginner, you can start with having a portal with a cannula and then you get to see the various structures. This is a rotator cuff and posteriorly you have a large hill sac defect here. This is an example of an anterior bunk art here. The large hill sac lesion. This is post repair. This is an example of massive irreparable rotator cuff tear, which is visualized in a diagnostic arthroscopy. Get yourself trained to do an open procedure. As a novice surgeon, you should also understand how to perform uh, open repair. For example, a mini open rotator cuff tear or uh, tendon transfer procedures, which may be needed in case if you are not able to do it, all arthroscopic. Understand the learning curve. Um, the curve is not as steep as you think. It has its own ups and downs. As a novice arthroscopic surgeon, you get excited, you get oriented to the subject and then understand the anatomy, the pathoanatomy, and get familiarized with the instrumentation and portal. Once you are familiarized, uh, you start doing cases individually. Familiarization of subject can be achieved by uh, through the various textbooks and various online materials are being flooded in the search engine. And uh, by attending the local regular conferences, either national or international levels, once you are familiarized with the subjects, start getting into uh, uh, triangulation skills by, uh, by having access to the local simulators labs, which will be available over the congresses or at your uh, fellowship centers. This will help you to better orient the triangulation skills and master the each simple surgical steps, either under your supervisor guide or uh, individually in the simulation labs. And uh, this, by performing uh, arthroscopic simulation skills, you will be able to achieve better hand-eye coordination and then get better orientation of the joint, thereby decreasing uh, the incidence of complications intraoperatively. And uh, post COVID, we are more pushed towards developing more digital uh, learning platforms and virtual reality simulators. Once you are oriented with the anatomy, the pathobiomechanics, and then uh, once you're oriented with the triangulation, the next step is to master the principles under your supervisor within the cadaver labs. I have a better orientation of the anatomy where you can learn new surgical steps and also to execute the learned steps. You also have an opportunity to meet the great mentors where you can have access to fellowships and where you can discuss the daily in problems which you face uh, during executing uh, the surgical steps. And the comparison cadaver versus simulation based arthroscopic training Simulator trainings help us to reduce uh, the 
uh, learning curve and also to better perform in cadaver labs rather than directly going into the cadaver labs. And you have access to do this surgical steps as multiple times as much you can master the steps. When you start practicing individually, remember you have to start with a very basic step such as doing a diagnostic arthroscopy, master the steps and principles and start doing basic debridements, subacromial decompression, loose body removal and perform biceps tenotomy. And start getting access to more complex surgeries such as a bank tear or a, a lateral repair or a small rotator cuff tears. It's best to do under supervision and get uh, the niche of the surgical subject and get oriented until you become the master. To uh, before I would conclude, uh, we have to understand that uh, each surgical procedure in shoulder arthroscopy has its own learning curve and you have to master it as you, as you advance. The take home message is learning shoulder arthroscopy. Uh, you, you can invite all the possible opportunities which is available to you, either in the form of simulation trainings or cadaver trainings, mentored independent practice or by taking a fellowship and shoulder. However, the cycle repeats depending upon the skill of the surgeon and until he becomes a master surgeon. And once you become a master surgeon, the role of patient care uh, sits on your sets on your goal and you need to understand that you need to be working as a team to have a better patient care. You need to have a physical therapist uh, who can give a good post-op and perioperative rehabilitation and anesthesiologist and then a proper administrator who can support you with all necessary instruments and devices as needed. With this, I wish you aim higher and become a better surgeon. Thank you. Thank you, Samaveshwari, uh, for that elaborate talk on how to start the shoulder arthroscopy, basics of how to start the shoulder arthroscopy. So just a quick poll before we move on to our next talk. Uh, what is your preferred uh, choice of position during surgery uh, in shoulder arthroscopy? Uh, Dr. Borti? I use uh, lateral decubitus for almost all my uh, arthroscopic shoulder surgery. When we started to do the arthroscopic lateral chair, we started to do that in lazy beach chair because we tried to copy La Fosse and Boileau. <laughs> but now we also do that in lateral decubitus. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Sundar, sir? I do all the instability in lateral position and cuff repair in beach, beach chair. Okay. Sandeep, sir? For all. all okay. Samudeshwari, I saw a beach chair. Yeah, beach chair for uh, all instabilities. Sorry, cuff and uh, lateral for uh, instabilities. Dr. Ravisha? Lateral. I've not tried beach chair yet. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for that. So, uh, uh, now we'll move on. The time is ticking. So, we'll move on to our next talk by. Our senior surgeon, our shoulder surgeon, Dr. Sundar Rajan, sir, from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. So, over to you. Uh, thank you, Neha. Hope you can see my screen. Can you hear me, Neha? Yes, sir. I can see okay. your. Thank you. So, my uh, I restrict my talk to the only anterior instability because uh, you are given a shoulder instability is a gross topic. So I just restrict to anterior instability and uh, I think indications also were spoken about, spoken by previous speakers. Maybe I will go about mainly anterior bank out repair uh, to how to do uh, tips and tricks in the, especially for the surgical techniques. I will restrict to only that part. Um, I think uh, when, you come, when you come to the bank outs uh, repair or anterior instability repair, the question comes when the patient comes to you first time itself with the dislocation whether to do an, a repair or not for an anterior dislocation or an anterior instability. I think we know that there are, from, with the literature, the children with the open faces can go up to 100% recurrence rate. We know that over the age of 60 years, the recurrence rate up to 22%. So naturally, we had to balance between this 22 to 100%, depends upon the age group, and we had to decide whether these patients required surgery or not. And uh, this is one of the uh, very good paper from the JBJS in 2008. I think uh, for this 25-year follow-up conservative treatment study, where they found that the recurrence rate of 72% in age to 12 to 22 years, 
and 56% of the patients aged 23 to 29. So you can see that second decade and third decade are very crucial um, in getting this recurrence. So it's very important that these patients have to be counseled that about this uh, recurrence rate and they have the first dislocation. And uh, in these patients, sometimes we can manage with the surgical management for anterior dislocation. That's what they started with in an anterior cruciate ligament tear. Maybe 15 years before, nobody might have agreed to do an ACL reconstruction when the patient comes with acute rupture of anterior cruciate ligament. All, all the time, at that, that, that time, teaching was that if the patient comes back with only recurrent instability, you should do surgery. But later on, we came to know that this by doing, by allowing like that, patient can get more meniscus and control damage and can resulting in a secondary OE at a later date. So like that in the younger patients with the high recurrence rate and these patients can be counseled for surgery. At the same time, the activity level should be considered for any patients present with you first time. If the patient is an athlete or a manual laborer who will perform overhead activities or an younger patients or practitioners of high impact sports, we know that this recurrence is going to be high level. So you have to the same patients if a same model, middle age office goer, non-dominant hand, then you should not think about even if it's a 25 years, 20 years, 28 years old, if he's not a very big sport player, you can treat conservatively. So it is not a single factor which decides whether patients require our surgery. You have to consider about the age factor, you have to consider about the dominant factor, consider about the activity level or the sports. Everything has to be considered. And also it's important that first time you should not be some kind of injuries like a bony bankard. Because it's because these patients, any patient says that you no, know, the clinically apprehension positive and less degrees of abduction and external rotation, when they present to you on the first time, even after the reduction of the dislocation, we should suspect sometimes this patient could be having the bony pancard because we know that the bony pancard patients can go come with the recurrence rate and this patient may require an operation. MRI also helps you to find out other associated injuries like a slap in the older patients, like we talked about the rotator cuff tears. And bony lesions can be easily picked up here. So it's very important that these patients, especially in the young patients, we have to do an, uh, further investigations. If you suspect something, make sure that you find out all other findings, then that makes the difference in, in making the diagnosis and the prognosis for the particular patients in surgery. The same patients comes with the recurrent instability. The, the most important questions, what we generally ask, how many number of dislocations. With that, you can calculate that quality and we can give you a rough idea about the quality of the labrum or the capsular laxity. And when was the first dislocation and it was reduced by itself or required anesthesia, that gives you a clue that if the first time dislocation reduced by itself, that by travel trauma, then we know that this patient may have a generalized laxity, capsular laxity, and this may not be a big traumatic anterior dislocation. And also the sports activity is very, very important. As already talked about with the low demand activity, sometimes you can uh, discuss about the only soft tissue repair or a bony repair, even the uh, dynamo comes between the 10% to 20%. If there is a self readjusting shoulder, then we should suspect this patient might be having a 270 degree tear or a 360 degree tear, could be a panlabral tear. So this has to be considered because MRI cannot pick up sometimes these panlabral tears. Sometimes we put a scope, it will show you anterior lateral tear. If you put a scope, then you can have a panlabral tear. So that requires a 360 degree repair, which is going to be a, uh, which is going to cost loss to the, I mean, cost loss to the patient, which you may have, you might have not counseled for these patients. So this kind of history and examination can give you a clue that these patients can have a more injuries than what you have in the MRI scan. And this already talked about, so if the dominant or non-dominant, unilateral or bilateral, if it is a bilateral, then you know that it could be in a multidirectional or a capsular laxity. If it is a seizure, again, it could be in a, like a posterior instability or in a multidirectional instability so that you can rule out in, it, uh, in these cases. So when we suspect bone loss, so when you suspect a history of then the initial high energy injury, when the arm was abducted to 70 degree and extended to 30 degrees level, then that could be a, a bone loss because that can have a bony bank cut. Or the dislocations have, dislocation happens happened at 20 to 60 degrees of abduction Again, there's a possibility this patient may have a bony bank or a progressive or a bone loss. Or progressively easier subluxation with a long history of coping with instability. Again, you should suspect a huge bone loss and these patients may require, may, may have a lot of bone loss. So whenever you suspect the bone loss, when there is a global instability, the patients have it with less degrees of abduction rather than 1990. 
So it is important that the abduction test should be not, should not be done not only 1990. You should bring it to 60 degrees of abduction. It should bring to 30 degrees of abduction. Then that will give you a clue. So if we think that if we decided that this patient is going to have an anterior lateral repair, that positioning is very important. As I said, that I do it in lateral position. I think most of us are, will do a especially in instability lateral position so that it opens up into our anterior inferior space, which is which bit difficult in a beach chair position. That is my uh, opinion, but some expert surgeons can do a, a labral repair also in a beach chair position. So I, requ I require always 40 to 50 degrees of abduction, and you can see the slightly tilted table towards the surgeon so that uh, that can keep the glenoid um, horizontal. And patient should be adequately strapped because uh, in the with adidas with steps, head makes to be adequately elevated with the help of the uh, support because you should not have a Next strain can should not get any brachial neuropraxia, and uh, the pillow should be placed beyond the, all the bony points or the pad points. You should not have any uh, pro, uh, problem with the bony points. And the opposition arm kept in the rest in position like this, so that will help you to for the anesthetist to assess the BP cuff and the IV line. And this is the typical position which you see in the lateral position. You can see that this is the from the headset where you stand and operate. And uh, you can see that is how you operate from the posterior side. That is the head side where you operate from the, your superior portal. This is how your traction uh, helps you or 40 to 50 degrees of traction. And I keep the mayor table at the foot end and the, our, uh, then our staff helps you in that. And re regarding the portal in the, for the anterior instability, the three portals are important. One is the posterior portal, which is two centimeters below and medial to your posterior inferior acromion. And another portal is the anterior inferior portal, which is your working portal, and antero superior portal, which is uh, going to be your weaving portal. Entering the joint is always a tricky when you are a beginner. So, I, so make sure that you aim your. You see that my index finger is in the coracoid. You insert your trucker. Just keep balance your humeral head. Then slowly insert, <coughs> insert your trucker between your glenoid and the humeral head you will have a slight clack sound and with a sudden giving giveaway, that means you are entering the joint. So often you can go under the acromion most often. So you have to be careful that you should point slightly downwards and medial and towards the coracoid, then you can easily enter. Of course, as soon as you enter, you should have the diagnostic down. You, as soon as you enter, you see the uh, rotator cuff interval, then you see the subscapularis over there. Then you see the biceps, which is uh, uh, it can be assessed for your any slap repair, that is the biceps, then you assess the biceps groove, then you assess the cuff, whether it is uh, any in the older patients, you can have any cuff lesions. Then you can go behind and see the assess the hill sacs lesion. So this is how you assess your uh, bony part, that is the axillary fold, you come to the uh, antero inferior aspect, then you assess your glenoid labral tear, you can see that is a huge labral tear. Once you see, you are seeing through the posterior portal and you can view, uh, you can make a uh, anterior inferior working cannula from your uh, just uh, lateral to your coracoid or you can just insert your trucker, you can do a blind procedure also. You can just insert the trucker uh, uh, anterior, uh, anterior to the, uh, in the anteriorly and you can insert the cannula from there if you are struggling for your anterior in, uh, inferior working cannula then you put our own bigger cannula because you require at least 8 mm because you have to get all the instrument inside. Then your anterior superior cannula comes from your uh, just in front of your anterior uh, superior acromion. You just insert a needle. So you can see that, that is a white part which is the supraspinatus. So you try to go still in the rotator interval so that is an easy passage so that you don't damage your anterior supraspinatus cuff. So you just go to the anterior to this uh, sorry, uh, anterior to the biceps. But once you make the knee and insert the scope, that scope can come again lateral to the biceps so that that prevent the crowding of your scope and your anterior inferior cannula so that you uh, you don't have any uh, uh, back out of your anterior inferior cannula and you don't need to touch that. So you can move this side or that side, you can move your uh, scope on that side. Then once you move the scope you to anterior superior cannula, then Posteriorly, you insert around 6 mm cannula, so that is going to be mostly about the suture management, especially when you are doing with the anterior uh, instability repair. 
Once you made the, all the three portals, then you assess it. That is, you again, see, so you, you're assessing from the, again, still I'm assessing from the posterior portal. Don't miss the slap uh, lesion because sometimes MRI cannot pick the slap lesion. If you don't do the slap and when the anterior bank are prepared, the chance of failure is a bit high. You can see this patient had an extensive hill sacs. You assess the slap, you can see this patient had also slap lesion and also this patient had an anterior labral tear. So you, uh, you can deal with the labral uh, slap tear first and you can go to the anterior inferior labral tear next. When you do a slap, you can do a, again, come through the same standard. You can come through the rotator interval itself. Sometimes, sometimes the trajectory may not be good enough. So you can make a small portal in the anterior supraspinated just to insert your screw. And you can make a, a knotless anchor or a, a knot, uh, knotted anchors. It depends upon your uh, discom uh, comfort level. So you just prepare the glenoid. Here we are inserting a suture tape. And I usually I prefer to do on a knotless anchor so that your job is easier and quicker. And uh, this is how you do the uh, slap repair. Once you finish your, finish your slap repair, you come here. Again, you can see here, I change my scope to the antro superior portal, weaving through the superior portal, working through the antro inferior portal. That is the glenoid. That is the uh, labrum. You can see that it's like alp solution. It's almost uh, what one to two centimeter down to the glenoid. See, this labrum supposed to be here. It is so much down. So always I try, I try to release up to seven o'clock position so that you can mobilize the cuff very easily and you can bring it up. And uh, this is how you slowly release with your elevator. And uh, you can see that once you do the complete elevation and you see the subscapularis muscles inferior to that, then you can see that slowly the cuff is coming, sorry, the capsule labrum is coming up to the level of the glenite. From the alpha lesion, it has come to the labral level. Once you do that, then you can use a serrated shavers or you can use the rafts to prepare the medial part of the glenoid to create some biology over there. So that is very important for the labrum to heal over your new position. So you can see this is how you separate. You can see the entire uh, medial part of the glenoid. What you see down is the subscap muscle. So without liberating from inferior to superior, it is impossible to liberate your entire labrum to bring it to the glenoid level. So that is a very, very important step which take your own time. You can see that. So that is how you bring your labrum. Once you do the liberation, you bring it up. Then you try to shift from uh, the inferior to superior shift. That's how we can labral come to. This is, how the, this is the original position of this particular labrum. So once you've done that preparation, then you can use a single, uh, I mean, double loaded, uh, single uh, loaded or a double loaded uh, anchors. Uh, I prefer to use the always the double loaded anchors in the uh, almost at 5 o'clock or 5.30 position. Because I liberated up to 7 o'clock, usually I prefer to take bites on the 7 o'clock position. Here I usually use the postural lateral portal, but I don't make a cannula. Just make a percutaneous incision, make a small uh, nick on that. Then you bring your uh, opposite side, uh, your um, uh, indirect device of a uh, lasso device. You bring it there. It is very, very easy to bring it and take a bite at 7 o'clock or a 6.30 position. So this is how I take my first bite so that the whatever I liberated at 7 o'clock can be uh, taken up through this postural lateral portal and I take a bite and uh, I shuttle the first thread and keep it and park it over in the same postural lateral portal. So here I am exchanging the same thing with the uh, one suture and uh, one, one uh, suture and usually I park I, this is how this the both uh, threads for that seven o'clock uh, position then I take an another bite at, at around six o'clock so this is going to be my basically my shifting uh, suture so you can see that that is so much down it's sometimes very difficult this is the most critical step take your time Gently, I'm, I usually prefer to use the 25 degrees, but you can use even 45. By 25, is easy to use, and because of the short lever arm, you can see that slowly you bring it up, touch the bone, don't go and paste the bone, it will block it. You can bring it up like this, and you can see that my nenital wire comes, then you shuttle with your suture anchor. Always, I prefer to do the knotted uh, sutures for this uh, 5 o'clock and the 7 o'clock position so that your shift and control is easier rather than the knotless technique. So because this is a very, very crucial step, so always I prefer to do a knotless. 
So make sure that you are pushing the knot through the post which is on the lateral side. You don't come into the glenoid side because that can irritate your glenoid. So that is how you can pull your lateral uh, tissue superiorly so that you don't get any slack over there. Then repair your anterior inferior lateral, uh, your six o'clock. Then I uh, tightened the seven o'clock uh, position, which I do that. Any knotted technique is okay. This is, I use usually modified Duncan, or you can do a SMC or whatever knots you prefer. Sliding knot followed with the three half switches is very important for the security. Followed that second and third anchors are not, uh, uh, you can use a knotted or a knotless anchor. The same way you can use, here I prefer to use the knotless anchors. So they usually minimum you require at least three screws because to come up to the in front of the uh, subscapularis. So you can start from at 5.30, then four, then at least three o'clock or 3.30 the third screw, which you, which is has to be inserted. Because this patient also had a, a hill sacs, I done a rempli search. You can see that is the parachute technique of the uh, infraspinatus bites on the four sides. So that can, once, once you tie the knot, that will give you the posterior support for this uh, glycumeral head and also to be centered. And also it protect your anterior level tear. So I, my uh, repair, uh, my uh, take on rempli search is a bit aggressive in, in anterior level tear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sundar, sir. So, uh, any questions for Sundar, sir? Okay. So, uh, I have one question. So, so for uh, Rempli Sanj, uh, do you uh, uh, check it after your liberal repair, whether it is on track or off track lesion, or you plan it preoperatively? Yeah, usually I, don't assess, I usually assess under arthroscopically. Of course, we all, uh, you know, on track and off track in paper, it's very good all the time. But uh, most of the time, if I see any uh, depth of the hill sacs after assessing arthroscopically, in spite of um, uh, size and depth, I always do a rempli search. And unless it's very superficial, if there is no depth, if it is, uh, even the lesion is bigger, I may not do a hill sac, I mean, rempli search. Otherwise, I do the uh, rempli search. Maybe eight out of ten cases, simply search nowadays. What is your cutoff point of depth and size? I would say. So probably even if it's a two mm depth or three mm depth, I usually do it. Okay. Uh, what about you, Doctor Bo? Um, I have a low threshold to add the remplissage as well. Uh, it's not so easy for us to measure the depth and the width of uh, of the hill sac lesion intraoperatively, uh, but I often do take the arm out of the of the track attraction and and test it. Uh, but sometimes I decide before if there's a high risk patient, and you can see in the CT scan that there's a deep or broad hill sac lesion. But sometimes you come in to the shoulder and you see that the hill sex is more deep or broad that, than you thought on the pictures. And then, as I said, I have a low threshold to add the remplissage. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Sundar, sir, for the wonderful talk on instability. I know it is a lot to, uh, I mean, you, you should have got a lot of time, much time. But uh, with this, we would like to. Uh, move on to our awaited talk by Dr. Bertie Bo. Uh, she'll be speaking on rotator cuff repair uh, and subacromial arthroscopy. So over to you, Dr. Bertie. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Because it's a yeah. little bit little bit different than it was when he tried it. But you can see the presenter screen now? Yeah, I'm able to see. Yeah. Yeah. So Nea and Sashin, thank you so much for inviting me and to the Indian Arthroscopic Association. This is an honor for me to participate in your webinar. And uh I was asked to talk about the rotator cuff repair and, and uh, have a few slides on the subacromial arthroscopy as well. So these are my disclosures. So this is more of a technical uh, lecture. So uh, when I am to repair the rotator cuff, the first thing I do, of course, is a diagnostic atroscopy. 
uh, where we do the inspection of the long head of the biceps and move backwards to see, to get an impression of the insertion of the supra and infraspinatus. Uh, of course, we do a test of the subscapularis, which I will show you specifically in a later video. Um, and also assess the posterior and inferior capsule and look into if they have some cartilage injury, if they have a heel sex lesion, because some rotator cuff tears are, of course, um, after they have had the luxation. And uh, also look for labral injuries, of course. So the steps in uh, my rotator cuff repair would be first, I consider whether to do biceps surgery, either tenotomy or I prepare for a tenodesis. Uh, most of the time I do it intraarticular, but uh, sometimes also uh, subpectoral. And um, I also prefer to do the repair of the subscapularis before the uh, posterior superior cuff. Uh, so if that's necessary, I do it uh, in the beginning of the procedure. After that, I uh, prefer to do the preparation of the tuberculum major footprint when I still have the camera in the joint, if it's possible. Because um, I think I have a better view of the footprint from the joint side. And also, you know that sometimes the uh, rotator cuff co comes in layers and then you might miss the inferior layer if you don't make up your mind when you're still in the joint. So um, then you move the camera to the subacromial space and do the bursectomy. So you get the overview from uh, the bursal side and plan uh, your number of anchors and plan your technique if you think uh, you need a um, double row and how many anchors. And uh, in the end, if necessary, a subacromial decompression. So uh, this is how I um, consider if I have a tear in the subscapularis. In this case, it looked almost normal when you have your camera in the posterior portal and you look around um, and the humeral head looks nice in the beginning and you push backwards and you see that there's a partial tear in the subscapularis. So this is an important step. And I also um, um, palpate and release if there are adhesions above uh, the labrum underneath the supraspinatus. Uh, and uh, of course, you can do your biceps tenotomy with a scissor or a knife. But when you're already in there with your electrocautery, it's also just a few seconds to do it with the electrocautery. And of course, you have to be uh, careful so you don't go too far medial in this situation because then you might um, injure the uh, suprascapular nerve. So I look at my electrocautery device and I know it's approximately one centimeter until uh, the, um, the black mark. Uh, so I know how far in from the edge of the glenoid I have moved. So as I told you, I like to prepare the footprint from the joint side. So here the camera is still in the joint and I'm preparing the footprint on the tuberculum major for my supra and infraspinatus tear. This is uh, working from a lateral portal. And then I move to the subacromial space. And of course, doing a cuff repair is often a lot of cleaning up. So you have to do the debridement of the bursa. I like to start underneath the bone because that's always safe when you feel your instrument is on bone. And uh, for some cases, uh, you are tempted to use the shaver because it's more efficient to remove tissue. However, then sometimes you regret because it starts bleeding. And especially when you go medial in the fat tissue, uh, it's very often uh, a bleeding there. So of course you have to remove enough tissue to see your uh, rupture and see that you can place your suture properly. But I try not to go too far medial if I don't have to, because there are the bleeders. So here we still have um, the camera uh, posterior and uh, vapor coming from lateral when I do the cleaning. But often I like to switch them. And here is the camera lateral. 
looking into the defect and the electrical trip probe is coming from the posterior portal. And in the beginning, this might be a little bit difficult because it turns everything like upside down, but it's very useful for learning and it gives you another view of the defect. So now the camera is posterior again, and uh, I need another portal to place my anchors. So often I go with a needle first, just to see where the anchor will come. Try to stay pretty close to the acromion. And I use anchors that uh, has to be threaded before uh, you screw in uh, the anchor. And then you also get an impression of the bone quality. And uh, I know that many surgeons uh, uh, use uh, needles or awls to make uh, micro fractures in the footprint to, to better the healing of the cuff. Uh, these anchors are, um, uh, are uh, threaded and, and uh, so, so the good stuff from the bone marrow is supposed to come out from the anchor. But of course, if you have a situation where you doubt the healing, you can add some more holes to get bleeding in the in the footprint and you have to keep track of your sutures so after uh, putting in the anchor uh, in the beginning I advise people to take out just one or two sutures in the cannula so you don't mess up with the sutures because that happens very often in the beginning and there are different techniques of course uh, there's not just single or double row but there are different ways to do also a single row. Uh, this is an ordinary mattress suture with this uh, uh, suturing device. And uh, many studies that has compared single and double rows, they are comparing a very old fashioned single row with an advanced double row. So um, even if this is also called a single row, uh, the mattress sutures can be placed uh, in, in, in a crossway fashion and they can be placed um, um, inverted. I will show that in a minute. And also you can do a kind of mason elm technique um, with uh, your suture and that's a kind of advanced single row compared to those totally easy. So here is an inverted mattress, you saw that I turned the suturing device 180 degrees around, shooting from uh, the superior part of the supraspinatus or infraspinatus with the first stitch. And then you take the suturing device all the way out again, and you reload it with the same suture. And uh, when it comes in back, um, you do a suture the other way. And in this way, you will have no suture between your tendon and the bone. So theoretically, that will be good for healing, that you can now tie these two ends and you have no sutures between the tendon and the bone and you kind of compress the tissue down to the footprint when you tie the knots. So tying knots, of course, you have to uh, pull in both directions to be sure that everything is, uh, is uh, tight. And when you're done with your first anchor or when you start planning, of course, you have to think of how many anchors. And my rule of thumb is that for every 15 millimeters, I need at least one new anchor for the for the first row or if I do a, a single row repair. And then's the question, if you will need a lateral fixation. Well, in this case, I decided to, to do that, but uh, I have to admit that the evidence is not that convincing that I always do a double row. So um, um, just when I think it's needed or uh, especially if it's a huge rupture or if it's a re-operation. For small supraspinatus tear, I often do a single row. And um, 
yeah, this is just a fixation of the lateral row. And then the question, if we should do subacromial decompression, because I know many surgeons do it. They do it both for subacromial pain and after suturing their rotator cuff. I have to admit that there are more and more cases that I don't do it, even if it's a degenerative cuff. Because according to the evidence, and this study from a Norwegian group uh, in cooperation with the Finnish people, the evidence is strong that we do way too much subacromial decompression, even for those uh, patients where we have sutured the cuff. So have to think about that if it's necessary to do the decompression. And of course, it depends a little bit on the shape of the acromion. And it's more likely to think that it's uh, smart to do uh, decompression if it's a hook type. Uh, while it's hard to believe that uh, doing a decompression in a type 1 flat acromion or a slightly curved acromion uh, should do any difference. So it will also increase the bleeding uh, when you do the operation. So the evidence does not say that it is absolutely necessary. If you do it, you can uh, you can do it uh, in either position you want, of course. And and um, uh, after a cuff repair, you have already resected the bursa. But in subacromial decompression, of course, you have to resect the bursa so you can see the edge of the um, acromion. Then release the coracromial ligament and resect uh, between five and seven, seven millimeters of bone with the with the bone uh, shaver. So when you have ended the procedure, either you do just suture or you also do a subacromial decompression. Again, I always put my camera lateral to see the repair. Uh, so I at least see it from two different directions. That's also very smart for the learning in the beginning. So that's about what I wanted to tell you. And uh, just to, to finish the lecture, first consider the bicep surgery and then do the subscapularis. At least that's my preference. Uh, I prepare the footprint from the joint. Then you have to clean up the subacromial bursa and plan the number of anchors and the technique. And in the end, you can consider doing a subacromial decompression. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bo. It was really nice to see your talk. And um, if anyone has questions for Dr. Bo, <laughs> you are very clear because no one has questions. I have one question for you. One, I'm, one question. I'm not sure if we do it exactly the same way because there are often different traditions in different countries. So, <laughs> yes, please yeah. ask. Yeah, may one comment? Maybe yeah, I think so. I think uh, uh, wonderful talk, uh, uh, Dr. Bo. And um, they really, they're going to come to the controversy, usually subacromial decompression. If you take a 10 to 15 years before, uh, people used to do a isolated subacromial decompression with huge numbers. But if you take now, hardly I do a isolated subacromial anterior decompression because we know that uh, differential diagnosis can be mixed up with subacromial impeachment and mistaken people who are doing an isolated subacromial decompression. Even the people doing with uh, subacromial decompression with the cuff repair dramatically has come down. Now we know that. We no need to do on a decompression unless it's a, like a type 3 acromion, like what you showed, like a hooked acromion. Otherwise, uh, when you do a, after doing a repair, we reassess, then we do a subacromial decompression. And also, we moved from anterior subacromial decompression to the lateral acromioplasty because most often we know that now that uh, whatever the impeachment you get by doing an abduction and internal rotation, the impeachment not just in antro superior it is from anterior to posterior direction of your acromion so when you try to when you decided to do an acromioplasty then we do an a lateral acromioplasty so that gives you good space for the uh, shoulder to move in and it protects your repair 
Yes, and thank you for the comment. And uh, as I told you, I very seldom do it now. And but I um when you do it, I have a question back to you. <laughs> when you do it, do you consider it from CT scan or pictures before, or do you consider it during the operation? Because it might be very difficult to tell if it's really tight during the operation, because that also depends on the position of the arm. Absolutely. Because yet I don't do this at preoperatively. Usually I assess intraoperatively. Sometimes we know that when it's especially type 3 hook chromium, when you have a retracted tear itself, then you know that the space is very narrow. Even before deciding your root, I mean, it's a cuff repair, we can do an acromioplasty. But sometimes what you see, you think that there is a good space. Once you put back the cuff to your footprint, then you know that there is no space at all. Then you think that at the time you decide, okay, better do an acromioplasty so that there won't be any impingement when you do the rotation. Yeah, and of course, it's it's a small and easy procedure when you're a skilled surgeon. So it takes you like three minutes. So it's no big deal. But, well, we don't have evidence that it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> yes, that's why our numbers have come down. Unless and otherwise it's necessary, we don't do a routine acromioplasty. Maybe that is the point beginners should take. We don't need to do a routine subacromial plasty. Yes. Yeah. So uh, there is a question from, from Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, sir. Is there any role of Mumford procedure? Oh, yes, there are. Uh, if they have a specifically local pain over the AC joint, uh, we do a Mumford still. And um, most of the time I do it arthroscopically. But if it's a Mumford procedure with no other need to do a shoulder arthroscopy, I sometimes do it open because that's even easier if it's the only procedure. Okay, sure. Um, I have one question if I can ask. Okay, Sundar sir, you can ask. No, no, regarding the Mumford procedure, of course, we used to previously excise the lateral one third of the clavicle. I mean, most of the time, I mean, uh, we, uh, when you have an isolated IC joint arthritis, that is also now many patients will become all right with conservative treatment or an injections. So very few patients require an isolated Mumford procedure. But we do, sometimes we do that procedure when we have an associated cuff tear with the patient also as having tenderness over the AC joint, we do a, a arthroscopic excision. That also we moved out. We don't excise the lateral one third. Mostly I do mostly I excise the spur, whatever the spur, which is impinging on the cuff. That's what we do most of the time. We, we are slowly we from 10 mm to 5 mm we came. Then now we are doing mostly <laughs> only the osteophyte excision, which is impinging the cuff. Right. And so in Indian population, they have uh, noted that acromion is quite thin. So uh, that's why just osteophyte excision would be better in such cases. Yeah, more than enough. You don't need a, you don't want any impeachment. So we don't need to aggressively excise the uh, lateral on the clavicle because people, when you excise the lateral clavicle, you the damage the superior capsule that can create an AC joint instability. So better to avoid and excising the clavicle. Even there is only spur osteophyte, just excising the. Uh, spur and uh, decompression, the uh, decompression of that particular area is more than enough. Yeah. So I uh, just one question. Um, in the situations where you have a subchondral cyst right at the suture insertion site, so anchor insertion site. So how do you deal with this situation? Oh, uh, depends on the size of the cyst. If you still can avoid it with your anchors. And of course, if you are in doubt whether you have a secure fixation or not, you should add the lateral row or you could kind of um, pull your sutures in a little other direction. Um, yeah, I think that will be the solution to, to, to at least secure it with a lateral row. So do you uh, move that uh, anchor medially or laterally to the cyst or... Anthroposterior, where, where would you? Well, well in, in, in general, you, you can medialize between five and 10 millimeters uh, without, uh, uh, without giving the patient inferior function. So if you can solve it by, by moving your anchor closer to the cartilage 
and then a lateral row and avoid the cyst. Of course, that could be a solution. Um, yeah. Okay. So what is your solution, Sundar, sir? Yeah, so you know that when the patient has got cyst, you know, preoperatively. So you will be usually more careful. We expect this complication, uh, this expect this uh, issue when you go inside. So you try to avoid, but it is intraoperative. You cannot decide where is your incision level of the cyst. It's very difficult to assess. You don't have any CT navigation to assess it. So what happens? You don't use your here. You have to be very careful that you don't use your tap. The tap uh, you should not use at all. You just gently use your uh, your all to see that whether you are entering the cyst or not. So suppose if you think that you are entering the cyst. You can easily move your anchor site also, whether anterior or posterior to that particular cyst. Suppose if you have done already this all, then sometimes what we can do, as uh, Dr. Bo said, you can change your direction, whether to a medial, a medial side or lateral side or a posterior side, or you can go slightly even deeper to the cyst. Sometimes the hole can be better if you are you already entered your uh, cyst site. So this is how you can make your small tips and tricks to avoid the cyst, but uh, you cannot avoid completely. But uh, you can always change your, uh, even if you put all in the cyst, uh, right. it doesn't matter. You can take it out, go at least sound on the ATM, medial to that, I mean, 90 to that, or lateral to that. Okay. Uh, Samudeshwari has one question. Okay. Yeah, Samu, you can ask. Uh, to Betty and the expert panel, what is your experience with uh, PRP or BMAC injections uh, to augment your rotator cuff repair? Do you use it regularly or for what kind of patients do you prefer? No, I, I don't use it at all in shoulders because uh, the evidence is not strong enough for me. And uh, I work in a public hospital where we have to think of um, uh, how we use the people's money because it's actually the Norwegian people's monies who's paying for the hospitals <laughs> with their taxes. So we have had, um, we have followed the literature and so far it's not enough evidence to say that this works in rotator cuff repair. So we use it in knees, but we don't use it in shoulders so far. Okay. In a our uh, we have a hospital policy i think this i'm going with the same vein like but we don't use it even in the knee joint we don't use it in shoulder we don't use it in knee joint okay so there are no questions now in the chat box sandeep so no questions thank you uh, dr neha for telling this webinar it was a wonderful webinar for the last one and a half hour. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ravisha for an excellent talk on the examination of the shoulder. Then Dr. Mahisha gave very good uh, lightning way up to the dark spaces. It was wonderful. And I'm sure Dr. Samundeshwari uh, surely inspired many people to take up and start doing shoulder arthroscopy. And as usual, uh, Dr. Sundar showed very wonderful videos an excellent presentation about the shoulder instability. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Bo for making this on a short notice and for a busy schedule. And we gave excellent talk on the little support and about the subacromial activity. Uh, we got to learn many exciting uh, uh, things. Thank you very much. And I'm thankful to all the viewers on behalf of Indian Agriculture.